Okay guys, welcome back to the channel. It's gonna be a video for the more hardcore audiophile. I like to show you stuff that's eye candy, ear candy, just fun stuff as well. But sometimes I like to get into the weeds and this is one of those Zoom interviews with Steve McCormick that I think a lot of you that are kind of like me that like to get YouTube content that sometimes gets really into the details. Not too much, but share some things that, at least for me, when I come across uh, either people or conversations that really make me think and things that I haven't heard, which is kind of rare, not to say I know everything, but after 30 plus years, almost 40 years in the hobby, uh, there's not often that I come across situations where I'm hearing and learning something's new. And what I did while I was in LA for Coachella is visited uh, Andrew Jones's facility, his studio in West Hollywood. It was right up the street from Sunset Marquee. Steve McCormick joined me. And I'm gonna have a series of videos. One is gonna have mostly music clips and a tour of the place. Uh, another one I'll give you some preface on that part. This video is gonna dive a little more into the weeds where Steve and I talk about our visit. I'll show you some uh, excerpts of the room and some pictures and stuff like that that you'll see at different points in this Zoom. But we're really trying to get across something that came out kind of a value added thing from this whole trip that I think hardcore audio audiophiles are like. It's about, I guess the biggest takeaway is, there's objectivist and subjectivist in this hobby. But even among the objectivist, what I'm learning is that just because somebody takes a speaker outside and measures it uh, one foot away and provides measurements, that's not a basis to make conclusions about a speaker or even make mods or or whatnot. It's not extrapolatable all the time to what is at your listening position. And what I've learned from, again, a legend in the industry, Andrew Jones, this visit really brought home the point that even among objectivists, there's uh, arguments in terms of what is the best way to do these measurements and provide value and interpret them. So what you're going to hear is Steve and I talking about some of the things that we learned while visiting Andrew Jones' studio, how he measures gear. It's on a whole nother level than anything I've heard of before. And again, it's about his experience, his access to technology, his entire career that other people never had, access to anechoic chambers. And we went, I wanted to dive into the weeds with Steve and the Zoom. For those of you hardcore audiophiles that really like to understand why things may sound, why does the source point at such a low budget point achieve such high results? Now you're gonna hear in another video I release, in Andrew Jones' studio, how good it sounds. So if you liked it at the show conditions, just wait. Now, again, cell phone video may not give you 100% of that value, but you will probably understand and hear how good this sounds, even with cell phone video. And I can tell you firsthand, it sounded amazing. Uh, Source point eight, you can't beat it at that price. But this, this video is gonna go more into the weeds. Also, how many of you have been subscribers long enough to know what the rest of my shirt says? Not gonna tell you. See if somebody can mention it in the uh, comments. Anyway, uh, this video is going to be in the weeds, Zoom interview with Steve McCormick and I. I'll have part two, part three, like I mentioned, of this Andrew Jones visit because it was really spectacular. Thank, Big thanks to Andrew Jones. He, he hosted us for two hours uh, on a Friday, I think this was, or Thursday, I'm sorry, Thursday, and uh, was so gracious with his time, so frank. I wish I had filmed the entire two hours, but sometimes I go to these things and it's more not just for public consumption. Sometimes it's, you know, get a frank conversation with these guys and learn. And I'm sharing, and Steve and I are going to share with you today, some things that were in those two hours that I didn't capture on video. The other videos I release will have some actual video excerpts and music, as I mentioned. So without further ado, here's Steve and I talking about that visit with Andrew Jones. Well, what I thought we could do, what I kind of wish I had recorded was the stuff in the actual measurement room because there's lots of people that have the impression that measurements taken outside just lifting the speaker off and the, making the mic a foot away gives you a good impression of how good the speaker is and even can be extrapolated to far field and really what he was able to at least convince me is that it's much more complex than that there are nuances and things that he does differently even he was talking about the angle, he was talking about the port, 
Um, he was talking about lots of things that it probably are even more suitable to your experience. And you could put in layman's terms that we could talk about. I think the the thing that came into focus, I, maybe I'll say, um, with Andrew was just the depth of his experience. Um, I mean, anybody who looks into his background will come to realize that he, he's been really studying uh, speaker design and related phenomena going back to his days in college, um, even before he joined KEF, which uh, I think was in 83, 1983. Uh, so he already had a strong background in computer-aided design of crossovers and, and optimization of, of crossovers. Um, and then but in our discussions when we were talking with when we're talking, you know, this came about because we were talking about his um, anechoic chamber that he had put together there in his his office in Los Angeles. And it's relatively rudimentary, <laughs> certainly compared to the access he's had to incredible facilities in the past. Um, oh, yeah, this is a shot inside his do it yourself, anechoic chamber. And you can see um, the stand that he's got, the speaker stand is on a turntable with calibrated. Um, and you can see the rig that holds the microphones uh, just beyond it to the right. And then test equipment and microphone um, capsule collection, all the, the mic power supplies and preamps and things are there. Uh, to allow him to to run tests there. Um, and he can make a lot of very meaningful measurements there. <clears throat> but um, one of the things that he had uh, access to incredible facilities um, at, at KEF, um, as we learned, and you know, a lot of there was a lot of really seminal research being done in audio equipment design, speaker design, all sorts of things in the UK back in, at that period of time. And and prior to that, I mean, you go back to uh, some of the very earliest work done in acoustics and speaker design and microphone design. You know, it comes out of out of Britain um, going back into the early 1900s and then coming forward. Uh, but he was saying that they had access at KEF to a, a very large anechoic chamber facility um, and access to the, the sonar technology out of the military at the time. Um, I'm, I'm presuming that these things were not owned by KEF, but they had access to the, the, this, these facilities. And so they had even then um, all of the equipment required to do the measurements that, that you need to take and the computer analysis uh, equipment to analyze the results and really understand these things in a very you know deeply scientific way. Um, so in fact, a lot of the tools that are available now are, you know, they're cheaper and easier. A lot of people can can own them if they care to. Uh, but you still are hard pressed if you don't have an anechoic chamber. So you wind up doing these gated measurements, these you know um, things to um, process out the reflections coming back from the surrounding room, whatever that may be. That's why you see these people going outdoors and putting their speakers up on cranes and doing all that sort of thing. Um, it's to try to replicate the effects of having a a big anechoic chamber. And the point about it being big, at least in my understanding, is that you can then make meaningful measurements down to a very low frequency. Um, so for a full range speaker, you know, you'd like to be able to make accurate measurements down to around 30 Hertz or so, <clears throat> or as low as you can get. Um, and that gets progressively more difficult as you're, anechoic chamber gets smaller or you know you don't have these kinds of facilities um after he left kef i know he was with infinity for a while anyway when, when he wound up with pioneer and then they created tad um technical acoustical devices i guess 
<clears throat> um, they again had access to some several very large anechoic chambers. Um, some of those here in, in California. Um, and so that again, facilitated his ability to measure these things, to create these new designs that he was, that he was coming up with. But, you know, he made the point that even though there's a lot of people with this equipment today and making measurements of various kinds that, um, they're not necessarily doing it correctly. Uh, that was the biggest takeaway is that yeah. we tend to put a lot of stock into somebody that does measurements and then either criticizes or makes points about the conclusions about the speaker, or even in the case of uh, some people, they mod the speakers based on these measurements. But the key is, are these measurements accurate? Are they really telling the entire story? And it's not so much a subjective versus objective debate. It's an objective versus objective debate of how you're doing it properly. And what really was the takeaway that I was impressed with and helped even more so elevate his legendary status is what you were talking about, his experience in knowing the weaknesses of just bringing it outside, yeah. putting a mic a foot away, does not really give you every picture. We talked about the port. That was very interesting how measuring well, the port. Yeah, I mean, especially when you're talking about gated measurements where, you, you know, you have a, just a brief slice of time, the speaker creates an impulse and, and you're measuring that while you're then turning off the measurement system before reflections can come back and, and influence that. But if, you, if you're if you doing that, then you, know, you get, into, get into the weeds about like, what axis are you doing that on? Are you on an axis of time alignment? You know, what is it you're getting from the speaker? If it's not a literal point source, if it's a multiple driver um, arrangement, then how do those integrate? And if you're if you have a measurement mic up close and a and a short duration gated measurement, you aren't you're not necessarily seeing the proper integration of all of those drivers. And then beyond that, if you get into systems that have ports and um, or, you know, even um, passive radiators or those sorts of things, um, how does their contribution affect what you're measuring? And is it integrated correctly into the measurement? Turns out, um, it, and I totally I believe Andrew on this completely, that's hard to do. And um, and. He's, of course, he's got tremendous experience and and um, uh, time to have evolved these measurement techniques, to have studied this, to have figured out how to go about this process to give useful results that really tell you um, what's going on with the speaker. But he'll be happy to tell you right now that He's had to get very creative and tricky about how he does these measurements to get mm -hmm. meaningful tests that go down to a reasonably low frequency. Um, and that's tricky. That's very tough. So having um, having the facilities, having access to the facilities he's had in the past with these big anechoic chambers, super useful to be able to do that. But very few people do. And so he, of course, was way too way too smart to name any names, but uh, he was saying that he he sees a lot of um, cases these days where people are doing measurements, but he knows that the results aren't really correct or not properly informative as you go down in frequency. I, I you know I think anything by the time you get to two hundred hertz and below, it starts to get suspect and and tricky. Um, yeah, and even his uh, techniques, I mean, I don't wanna, I didn't know, we didn't film this, that's why we're kind of talking about it, but, and I didn't wanna put a camera in his face, I didn't want to get, you know, his uh, frank input on what he's doing, but just, and not to give away any trade secrets, but some of the, even the mic placement and the angle of the speaker, it was very fascinating how he does things different than others. And yeah, he didn't name names, but, I think a great takeaway is just because you have some of these, even the Clipple measurement system, 
just because you have one doesn't mean you know how to use it properly and, and interpret the data. And that was another thing that when I visited Magico, they made a point that, yeah, only a few people even have the Clipple, but it's even fewer people that know how to use it properly right. and interpret the data. And that's one thing that they invested in at Magico was a person that specifically is an expert at that. He actually dialed in on my visit. But there's other people that just have, there's actually, I think, a YouTuber that bought a Clipple for his home. And I don't know him that well or not, but the, the point is, just because people provide measurements does not mean that that is the objective. You know, this is objective versus objective in this case, not a subjective versus objective, which I really found informative that you can't always rely on the measurements um, for more than just subjective opinion. Sometimes they're not really that reliable and extrapolatable to what you're hearing. Um, yeah, and, and getting back to Andrew, I mean, he has spent the better part of his lifetime now digging into how to do this properly, how to get meaningful measurements, and then also how the measurements relate to the subjective ex experience of hearing, you know, music from the speakers. So he's, um, uh, you know, to say he's an old hand at this is an understatement. Very, very few people have the, you know, the breadth of knowledge and, and the depth of experience that he's got in doing design. So um, to say that a product, a speaker product, especially is, you know, designed by Andrew Jones is not just an empty kind of compliment. Um, he he really brings an awful lot of uh, hard earned wisdom to the table. Um, and I believe that, you know, it really shows up in, in the products that he's done. Well, yeah, talking about show up, we had probably, we were there for two hours um and then the last probably 30 40 minutes was actually listening so we could take what we learned uh from his techniques and his wisdom and experience and then hear it with a very modest system in terms of electronics and the source point eights with no accessory help with subwoofers just a really nice room with yep which really impressed me you know you didn't have it filled with uh ugly room treatments like a lot of reference rooms are. Yeah, he was very beautiful. he was very clever and thoughtful about how he had done the acoustic treatment for that space. So it really has much of a, a very much of a living room comfortable kind of feel to it, but it's very well treated and it's an ex excellent sounding room. Um, and uh, of course, we were coming from my experience with the Source Point 10s and me being very impressed with those. And then now getting to hear the source point eights, which is the reduced scale version using a lot of the same technology in a smaller package, um, but incredibly impressive. And uh, they sounded they sounded excellent. And this he was using the um, Hi-Fi Rose integrated mm -hmm. amplifier, and I guess their streamer too. We really didn't stray too far from that. I did. He was kind enough to play one file that I had brought along. Uh, of um, live recording that I had done years ago, um, which is kind of a useful reference point for me, but um, uh, they sounded excellent. And again, totally surprising how much bass uh, and good bass uh, they're producing. In a real world room, because yeah. that he designed his room to kind of look like a lifestyle room, both aesthetically, size-wise, a family room that filled up a pretty large space with the base. This wasn't a, a small yeah. room and it, he didn't even have them against the walls for reinforcement. Not at all. They were well away. Well from, away. Uh, and um, I got the impression, <clears throat> I think I even said this in the video, is that after I was listening, there was points in that song, I, I felt like I really wasn't listening to speakers, which is really the key from budget speakers to some of the cost no objects, they give you that scale, they give you that realism, they disappear, they don't have the colorations of a box, all those things, the coherency where you're not hearing a bunch of drivers. Right. I got that impression. Now he did have really good material, but it was just material he found on Cobuzz that week. Sure. It wasn't like he was cherry picking a song. He said, this is a song I just found. Uh, in fact, when we asked him, he had to look it up who it was. He wasn't cherry picking stuff that was just gonna sound good on his system. And then he played your request as well. So here's a system and a guy that has total confidence in what 
he's doing and for good reason is what my takeaway was he was already a legend in my mind already but those two hours certainly helped push that to a firm standpoint of if he's designing a speaker i think you're getting super high level of experience that's hard to match and then the value proposition when you throw that in it's really incredible i really can't think of what i would recommend in that price point over that um you know, for the, the realism that I heard and the quality in that room, all things together and the pedigree of who's behind it. Um, I wish I had the entire two hours filmed, but we probably wouldn't have got all the insights that we got. So um, you're, you've posted that video of the the listening sessions that we did. Not yet. I have uh, sent it to him to approve just to, as a courtesy to let him. OK. Approve. And you did you put up a picture of the anechoic chamber. Do you have a picture yes. of his listening room? Yeah, let's. Uh, well, let's see here. No. Oh, wait, I cl click the wrong button here. So. Um, well, this is the this is when you first walk in the Mopa. Oh yeah, the entryway. Yeah, and then um, it's got some uh, LPs. Let me see if I actually have some of the video here. Um, let me stop sharing. I I, uh, I took a couple of pictures. Um, I I guess I assumed that you had taken some pictures, uh, just stills of the. Uh... Most of it was video in his oh, room, okay. but let me see if I can bring that up and share. It's going to be in the video I release with the. Uh... Yeah. Anyway, um, we don't have to stray too far, but you'll people will be able to see the. Oh yeah, uh, I do a walkthrough. Let's around do, here. Here are the clips that you've done. Um, yeah. In fact, yeah. I'll make it as a teaser. Guys that are watching, you need to yeah. subscribe and watch the part two. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it basically, that was a super impressive, fun part of what was a totally fun weekend. I did Coachella, some shopping, got some new outfits to wear at these shows, which, by the way, as FYI to anybody watching, I'm going to Munich. Then Lone Star Audio Fest just uh, asked me to come there in Dallas. Yeah. That's early June. Then we have the... LA show, which I think you're going to be attending that. It's in Costa Mesa. Uh, yeah, the 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 home entertainment show. The in home Costa entertainment, Mesa. Yeah. Costa Mesa. So you could see Steve there. And how, what's your what's your involvement in that? Is it mainly just well? It's kind of peripheral in a manner of speaking. Um, I do I make um, I do some work with Hi Fi One, Rick Brown of Hi Fi One. I do make a couple of products for him exclusively, including my top preamplifier, the, the VRE2 Hi-Fi One Edition, um, which will be part of the system. Now, uh, Rick got together, he's collaborating with a speaker manufacturer called MC Audio Tech. They have a relatively yeah. new speaker product that will be on display there, but Rick is providing the electronics, including my preamplifier and the burning amplifiers, mm. uh, cabling by Ncline, which, um, uh, mm -hmm. It's a line that Rick handles, um, and uh, that's going to be in one of the um, I don't know ballrooms, public spaces down on um, the um, banquet floor number two, I believe it's called the okay. Emerald, Emerald Bay Room number one. So it's a fairly large space. I mean, it's not like a hotel room. Um, it's one of the bigger spaces, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I hope. Um, I hope we get good results and can fill that space nicely with these um, MC Audio Tech speakers. Well, I have videos uh, at Rick Brown's house, if you recall, last summer. I think the mm -hmm. video was titled, uh, You Don't See Gear Like This Everywhere. Yeah. You get the Dolman Turntable, which we're actually going to be installing in our friend Doug's house, who has your amp yeah. and preamp. Uh, we're going to have lots of, he's got amazing gear, uh, the Reed Tone Arm. He still has that subwoofer that I need to revisit. Well, it's not even a subwoofer. Uh, the velocity the sub. Velocity and sub. Harry and Jensen, yeah. Yeah, and he's got the T the T doll um, Akira's, I think it was. Akira's. Uh, yeah, fantastic. If you're in a cost no object budget, that's mostly the lines that he carries, on table cables and stuff, and Steve stuff. Uh, he's definitely one guy to reach out to. I'll, also, I think you were telling me maybe I'll offer this to my subscribers, people watching, because obviously if they're watching. Mm -hmm. Uh, they may be familiar with your products, but didn't you have um, a TLC two preamp that 
you were we, we make a TLC2 preamp, um, okay. which is made to order pretty much. Okay. The VRA2 is my, you know, my statement magnum opus piece from the evolved from the VRA1, VRA1C, and now into the VRA2. Um, and that uh, is Rick, there's a version I do for him exclusively, the Hi-Fi One edition. Uh, that will be on display. <clears throat> okay. this, uh, but what show. I was talking about, I think I talked to Pat, your assistant. He was having one that might come on the market. These don't come on the market much. Um, no, that's version. true. And, and that would be under the heading of the TLC2. That's the one I, I wanted to maybe give a heads up to anybody before y'all put it on the market. I know these don't last very long. Um if you are a subscriber, want to reach out to me or Steve, they may be one of those coming available um, soon. And Pat was telling me about or it. Or we'll so. make you one. <clears throat> yeah. Give us a call. Exactly. We so, will customize it to your needs. That's going to be a good show. I mean, I love going to LA. Lots of fun. Uh, it was great seeing you there. Great being at the Sunset Marquee. It's such a historic and, hotel. By the way, let, let me just add, Andrew Jones is a wonderful person a very nice guy. Great to get to know him a little better. And that was, it was very kind of him to give us some, some of his time, a couple hours of his time. Yeah, there. two hours at least. His and, facility, yeah. I, I know that he's in demand a lot these days. Um, oh, yeah. His, you know, his work with MoFi on the new speakers and all of that stuff. So uh, he's a busy guy. Um, and we look forward to seeing what comes next from... From, and speaking of which, I mean, he didn't mind. give away, he didn't tip his hand, but the only progression I can see from here is doing a sub. Um, because really with the source point eight and 10, you have got pretty much what else do you want? Um, maybe that last octave for bigger rooms or whatnot. Um, and mm -hmm. I guess uh, that's something he might want to tackle. Um, he, he did talk about he loving the smaller size because he can measure it in that room a lot easier and not have to, you know, break his back. Yeah. So my guess is that a sub will come down the room. He didn't confirm or deny that, but he you know. did not confirm or deny. I, I guess um, I sort of got the feeling we would see something else before. Is that right? Okay. Sub. But it's just a feeling, you know. Okay. Nothing, well, we'll, we'll see what pops said. up. It looks... Yeah. I mean, obviously, when you're associated now with MoFi, it's both something that intrigues him, that he wants to do, that he hasn't done, but also something that's financially viable as a product. And so yeah. I just thought the iteration of now the next step for a source point owner, maybe that way. And then talking to him seemed like he does have some ideas and subs unique that maybe just like the source point. But we shall see. He didn't confirm that. Didn't seem, you know, even wink, wink like he's doing it. But um, yeah. That's my intuition, and that would be great to see, uh, because I think you have the potential with that system already to compete against cost no objects in a good room, setting them up properly. I really don't think, like you have iterated, that you're not far off from, you know, anything you wanted to benchmark it to for just yeah. simple music, music enjoyment. You know, I, I, well, you and I have talked about this um, largely because of what the the Bach. Um, system brings to the party when you when you make that a part of the equation and it's remarkable what happens when you do that um and the the way in which it it's hard to explain but it it sort of makes the associated equipment somehow somewhat less important <laughs> it's like a lot of the Minutia that we agonize over as audiophiles and looking for these, you know, little nth degree improvements and trying this and trying that. A lot of that just kind of goes out the window and doesn't matter anymore. Um, and uh, if you, you know, if you really want to get sucked into the musical experience, if that is your goal, then that's a, just an amazing piece of equipment, which I look forward to adding. But the, I think. Part of my point was that the source point tens that I've got are so good as is that you know it really becomes a question like you know how much more do you do I really want or really need without the Bach in the equation you can go yeah okay I, I'll spend a bit more I'll spend more money and get 
you know, a sound that's a bit more refined, a little more delicacy on the extreme top, et cetera, et cetera. But you're going to spend a lot of money to do that without giving up the other things that the source points already do. Really but there will well. be trade-offs. Yeah. Yeah. Some of the coherency and then, is, um, yeah. And then, you know, you throw, you put the Bach in there and. I, well, yeah, I, I mean, I came back for the, I think I'll have a video on this. I came back for the first time from a show. Usually um, when I come back from a show, the, I, I listen to the same tracks I listen at home uh, at the show. And, you know, I do have advantages here where for the most part, I always enjoy my room better, but this was the first time I'd come back with the Bach uh, in my room that I could benchmark what I heard at the show. And it was just like, I was like, every song I heard sounded so much better in my room with much more modest gear, price-wise at least, um, than well, you, you, the show. You must, have, you must have some awesome amplifiers. It must be the amplifiers, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> and the box. But yeah, uh, it's just the immersiveness, the realism, uh, so many benefits that um, I, I look forward to showing the box a little bit more, hopefully at that Lone Star Audio Fest. Uh, got a lot of people coming in. But as you should, if, when people put the box with something like source point, you are now able to be better in many respects than even these cost no object rooms. Exactly. Exactly right. Um, and if you already have a good system set up to begin with, um, yeah. you know, that it really, it's a leap forward in, in terms of engagement and involvement with your music. It sounds so much more realistic and involving. Um, and that's what it's all about as far as I and concerned yeah so i look forward to uh being with edgar at munich we're going to de de debut it on a i think he was there last year but this is the first year it's really got some traction um and then i wonder if andrew's going to be in did he say he was going to be in munich or not i don't recall but uh wouldn't wouldn't surprise me a bit uh, big enough, um, i think they would be yeah um i you know it may come down to a Kind of a cost benefit equation i don't know um do you know i think they've they got a pretty high profile at this point um i, I imagine sales are brisk mm -hmm. so it may not be something they need to do but um to, and, and they don't they wouldn't have a new i guess you could say the source point eight is the new product that they would be showing off there so yeah. i don't know but um that you know maybe they'll be there but he's certainly been doing more local shows around the U.S. here, Axpona, and he was in, I guess, Tampa when you were there. It was very interesting, again, not for public consumption, but uh, learning of the fortuitous combination and timing of Andrew Jones with um, MoFi and how that all transpired, him sharing a little more detail there. Again, not really for public consumption, but I thought that was very interesting. And again, um, that just the timing has been perfect and really um MoFi did good. they were smart to hire him when they did um not even knowing of some of the other things going on at the time yeah sure so um this has really worked out well like I said I can't speak more highly of Andrew especially after this last visit getting to know him better as well uh just knowing him anecdotally in the past so yeah, appreciate it. It was great for me, two hours of basically just listening to you two guys, uh, more like icons in the industry. I didn't have to do a whole lot of work other than just sit there and listen, uh, but it was super fun. Good seeing you again. Look forward to seeing you in June, if not coming to Munich, if you can. Yeah, I'd love to, um, who knows? We'll see if I, can, if I can swing it. Okay. Well, great. Didn't want to take too much of your time on a Sunday, but I thought it was good to get our little impressions to supplement what I'm going to be releasing yeah. on Andrew's stuff. So, uh, yeah. And I'll look forward to seeing the um, your videos of the visit there. Cool. Look All forward. right. Well, thanks again, Sound Steve. Clips. Have a good sure, Sunday, and we'll talk again soon. Sounds good.